Hi, this is Chuck Long, Solutions Engineer at Airspring. I first of all want to thank everybody for joining our webinar today. SIP Made Simple, SIP Fundamentals for Sales Success. What we're going to try to do today, and I, as, as a nerd, I, I often, when Ellen comes to me and say, Chuck, we're going to do some technical training for the sales force, I'm like, oh, here we go. But my goal is today is to explain to you how the SIP protocol works, as well as some acronyms and three-letter, what we call TLA, three-letter acronyms that you could put in your sales lexicon that makes you look a little bit more nerdy and technical than you actually are. Put it bluntly here. Remember, we're very transparent at Airspring, but we do know how our engine runs, and we're going to put a look under the hood today to see how that works. Uh, as Lanny would always do, a few groundskeeping here. Uh, we'll do the technical overview. Towards the end, we'll show you what spiffs that we're running as well as where we're going to be at the next coming 30 days and of course our wonderful Amazon gift card at the end there. Uh, what we will ask, we wait for questions till the end, you'll see a screen that says questions and John correct me but I believe it's star six to unmute yourself to ask questions. Come on it's Chuck, you guys ask me questions all the time so don't worry about it so let's get going. Alrighty, our agenda today, we've done the introduction, we're going to look at SIP and SIP trunking, we're going to define it. What it is it? How does it work? We're going to look at the elements of SIP. Agents, clients, servers, proxies, session border controllers, all those things you've heard about, what do they actually do? Then we're going to see in this SIP protocol how they talk to each other. You'll learn what a 404 means or a 503. Wonderful, isn't it? And if you're still awake, no, I'm just kidding. Then we're going to look at how QoS, quality of service, quality of experience for that SIP voice call or video call. How we measure the quality, how do we set the quality, how do we maintain the quality, and how we measure it. Then we're going to look how SIP interacts with other systems like PSTN and faxing, as well as a nice little feature that we support, of course, called SIP Refer. So we're going to start getting into different applications with SIP. We're also going to talk about security. SIP is an IP protocol. We don't want to be on the news as being hacked because they came through an Airspring SIP trunk. That's not the advertising we're looking for. So we're going to go how they work with firewalls and SRT and all those wonderful things. And then finally, we're going to show you four applications that you're selling today and applying the SIP technology that we learned. So let's go forward. What is SIP? Session Initiation Protocol. To a nerd like me, I think layer five right away. It's the session layer of the OSI, one through seven layers, right? But it's defined as a communication signaling protocol for the purpose of controlling multimedia communication sessions. Multimedia communication sessions. So that means voice, video, data can use the SIP protocol for setting up and tearing down sessions or calls. So. Right away, we said, well, we use it for SIP. I didn't know, for video as well as other data protocols. Your ISTPs, your internet telephonies, your carriers, your service providers, they all use SIP today. The majority of your voice calls around the world are SIP today versus PSTN or Public Switch Telephone Network. And the protocol itself uses HTTP language for configuration. Very simple, even a 10th grader can write the code as they say. Well, with me, you always get the history background. SIP came out in 1996. Yep, it's 21 years old. We should be buying it a drink, right? Well, it actually became a proper RFC in 1999, and of course, the SIP that most of us use today, I'm talking on it right now through our system, is RFC 3261. Why do I always bring up all these RFCs? Because it's a standard around the world. Standard-based technology and work your customer needs to know that it's standard so they're buying something that's not proprietary or a one-off. Next slide, please. So what is SIP trunking? Well, come on. We're all voice people in here. What is trunking? I'm going to show my age now. Back when I learned trunking, it was four-wire E&M analog trunks. This is back in the early 80s now that tied two systems, two PBX systems together so I didn't have to pay toll rates. And then in the late 80s, early 90s, they came out with this thing called ISDN, that on a PRI, primary rate interface, I would get 23 bearer channels 
in one D channel. What does that mean? You get 23 concurrent calls and one channel for signaling on those call all on one interface. Oh my God, that was amazing. SIP is the same thing, but instead of having a PRI interface, I'm going to have an Ethernet interface running SIP. Instead of being limited to 23B and a D, I'm only limited by the how big of a pipe that Ethernet interface between the PBX and the outside world is. So as you can see, it's just an evolution over 30 years. The now a SIP trunk, as we say, is a virtual phone line provided by the SIP trunk provider to the customer prem over Ethernet to their IP PBX. With us or anybody else, you can use T1 cable modem DSL, Ethernet over copper fiber, Ethernet, SDN, WAN to provide this service. We see in our diagram down here, very basic, whether you're selling Air PBX or you have your own phone system, it's going to go across the router into that trunk provider and you can make and receive calls. Just an evolution. The advantages, as we'll see throughout the presentation of SIP, is that it uses the same physical connection and logical connections that all your IP data does. So it can ride on your IP traffic for cost savings. So this is where the fun starts, folks. Now we, Chuck turns on his nerd hat, or they call me the professor here, is let's look at protocols that also work with SIP to make sure that your call works and you can hear the people. Session Description Protocol, or SDP to us nerds, is intended for describing multimedia communication systems for the purpose of session announcement, session invitation, and parameter negotiation. Yeah, you know a nerd wrote that. What do they mean? Well, it's part of the SIP packet that tells you, hey, I'm using G, and this is an invite for a G729 call for long distance in the SDP part of the SIP packet. So when you ask me, Chuck, do you support G729 and G711 on the same trunk? Sure, because we support that in our SDP packet. And of course, once it sets up the call, remember SIPs like SS7, it sets a control plane to set up the call between the two endpoints. Once it's set up, Inside the SDP packet, it tells you where the media is at so you can hear each other talk. That's how SIP works. So you have the control plane of SIP using the SDP to set everything up, get it nice and clean, and then you communicate with the real-time transport protocol back and forth. It's as simple as that, right? <laughs> so often... If you want to say when you're talking to a customer, of course we do 7.11 and 7.29. It's in our SDP packet. They're going to say, whoa, you guys know what you're talking about. Uh-oh, Chuck's bringing in graphs now. Look out. Getting real nerdy on the right here. But in the SIP world, there are two main agents that make this happen, as we saw in the previous plane, that phone call. One is a user agent client known as a UAC. And it sends out SIP requests. And then if you have a client, you've got to have a server, right? Client-server relationship. But a user agent server in SIP receives requests and returns SIP responses. So agents make, clients make requests. Servers respond to re receive those requests and return the response. Isn't that a very nice, polite protocol? Yeah, and then the nerds come in. Note. Unlike other network protocols that fix the role of the client and server, like an HTTP, in which a web browser is a client, can only act as a client and, a, and ever a server, in SIP, there are no rules like that. So I can be a client and a server at the same time if I want to. And we're going to see that in action here over the next couple slides. So once again, in this wonderful novel known as SIP, our main two stars are client and server. And literally over here on the right, on the graph here, you actually see what an Air PBX call would look like. It would get registered back to the meta. It would send an invite to make a call. The meta would say it's trying. And then it establishes the call. It says, OK. They acknowledge it. The RTP, we talk. Somebody hangs up. Buy goes one way. OK goes the other way. We're ready for the next call. Very easy. And that's all done within probably 60 milliseconds. So. This is a busy slide, but I had to define these, 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 how do I say, elements of SIP networking side because you hear it all the time and you see it all the time. Oh, we, we're going to go through the proxy server. Yeah, to, to register my uh, AirPBX SIP phone, I've got to go through this proxy server to get there. 
oh, yeah, but to get to the proxy server is going to send you through a best session border control that goes out the gateway to get you there. What? Well, let's see what's going on here. Proxy server. Network server with UAC and UAS components and functions as an intermediate entity on behalf of other network elements. Proxy server plays a primary role of routing, meaning that its job is to ensure that the request from that client is set to the other entity closer to the target. What does they mean here? They mean the router is going to get you to where closer to where maybe your SIP register is at so you can register. So most of the time when you see proxy server, majority of the time these days those are routers. Set up as proxy servers to answer your client request, keep it going, but it could be an IPBX as well. We don't hang a tag here. Anybody can be this, but a proxy server will usually route you, not touch any of the SIP header or the to and from field, but route you closer to where you need to go. Register. Whether it be you turn up an Air PBX phone, uh, it's going through its light sequence. It's actually registering back to the meta by your username. If it's a session, you're using your username and password. If it's a hard phone, they've been pre-configured by AirSpring to do this. Another part of that managed service we'll see a lot that AirSpring does here. It basically provides that SIP endpoint, that user client, a location service, meaning when my IP phone registers back to the meta, it's going to provide me all the dialing, all the services, my voicemail, my portal, all those wonderful things that it does once I register. The register accepts the request, records the address, which will usually be part of your E911 for the PSAP when you dial that to the user agent. Session border controllers, most overused thing in SIP there is. I think every PBX that does IP is a session border controller. Serves as a middle box between the clients and service for various types of tracks functions, including network topology hiding and assisting and network address translation transversal. Okay, Chuck, you're getting really nerdy now. A session border controller will sit between the client and service and actually change things in the to and from header so they can get out and make the call, getting closer to that register resource or an outside resource to make the call. We often call our SANSAs that we use for trunking a session border controllers. Why? Because those SIP trunks will register to the customer's IP PBX or our proxy server ADTRAN on site and provide outbound access for them. So you can see that working there. And then, of course, the gateway. What does the gateway do? Any device that takes SIP traffic off the SIP network and put on other networks like fiber channel networks or PSTN, TDM networks. So they're actually doing protocol conversion. They're converting SIP IP into TDM ISDN or maybe into other protocol packets. So as you can see here, I don't expect you're not going to answer the quiz that, okay, register, but knowing that, hey, when you go to register the phone, I know it's got to get back through the router back to the meta because the meta is where I'm registering at. Proxy server is the ATRAN but the proxy server might also be an, Air, an IP PBX. So these are labels of functions that they do with the protocol more than the hardware device itself. And as you'll see, there are devices that do all four of these things. There's a lot there, I know, so we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. But you do see a little GUI or thing there of the registering uh, response. Now, when a client talks to a server or talks to a gateway or a session border controller or all the above, they have to have their own language. Just as I'm speaking English now, or actually American, we talk, we don't speak English, uh, or Spanish or French or hand signs or whatever in each protocol, use a client has three things it can do. It can ask for an invite or invite, it can say bye, or it can register. So the first one is off hook. Buy is on hook, and register turns you on as far as your phone goes, right? On the server side, uh, there are six levels of responses that the server can provide to the client. 1XXs are informational or progress reports. I'm trying. I'm calling. These are 180 or 100 responses back. 200 is what you want to see. Everything's good. Yay. Success. 
The next three uh, is proxy. When we do a DTO because we can't get to a SIP trunk, DTO, direct trunk overflow, we actually get a proxy back and we redirect it to the next number. So proxy means I need to redirect you to another resource to provide the request that you want. Then we get into the client failures and the server failures. 404, client, couldn't find what you wanted. Just as you get when you get a 404 when you, with an HTTP request, same message, different meaning because it's in a different protocol, but those responses come back. These are used to help troubleshoot. Why am I only getting audio one way? Those type of things. Server failure means I couldn't register because you got a 503. The register you asked for, I can't find. I don't know where they're at. Because remember, SIP is an IP protocol that's going to check the local LAN first before it starts looking for gateways, session border controllers, and or proxy servers to get off the local LAN. And then finally, and I bring this up with some dismay because of all the natural disasters we've had lately, 6XX or global failures, it's busy everywhere, try something else. So as you can see, this is used by their technicians when we set you up our turnup team, uh, Craig Rahoy and that group, or Amy Garado's team in service. These are the things we look at as we're looking at your packets hey, we didn't get an invite, why there's no calls going out, the customer's not sending out any invites. Or if it's an inbound call, we're sending in an invite, but we're not getting back any 180 or any trying, you know. So these are all used to troubleshoot the calls. And you'll see this, we call this the SIP quadrilateral. If you ever go to get a SIP job as a nerve, they'll make you draw this. But as we can see here, phone A is calling phone B. It's not on the same local area network. So it's going to go to a proxy server to get over to B. It's going to send out an invite. The proxy is going to act like phone B. It's going to answer, hey, I'm trying while it's inviting to B. Then B will send back a session in progress back to the A. And with a 200, meaning I got your call, I'll acknowledge that 200, and we start talking. Now, it took me about 30 seconds to say all that. It did that in about 10 milliseconds. So as you see all these handshakes, oh my God, no wonder why it takes so long to set up the call. No, it's usually very, very fast. And of course, in this case here, phone B hung up, thus creating the buy, and then phone A hung up and you got the status okay. So the proxy in the middle knows everybody hung up on both ends, thus a SIP call. Okay, so there we see the players. We have clients, we have servers. We have messaging going between the clients and servers, and pretending on where I'm sending, you know, my two field says 818-738-1910. It's not on the local LAN. Send it to the proxy server, the ATRAN, that shoots it over the local loop, that takes it to the airspring and connects me to the SAN saves, and we all make a phone call. But how do I make sure that phone call is going to sound good? Where's the quality of service, quality of experience? Well, as you know, in my past presentations, we will do that with our ATRAN, all the voice traffic on those managed connectivity loops you guys sell tons of, and thank you. That voice on there has an SLA. It's protected with QoS. We do it with DisServe 2474 RFC, where we're going to mark every packet of voice at the layer 2, layer 3, send it through the network, and make sure it gets there. Customers doing SIP trunking, a lot of times they come directly to us, and I tell them, you have to set your own QoS. A lot of times I run it over our MPLS loops. The MPLS sets up the highway, but unless those packets are marked by the customer, They'll never get in that diamond lane or the express lane. This is where we'll show you with SDN WAN, we can help you out there. But once again, we are using the standard of DisServe, setting up the voice quality that's supported end-to-end -end with our product, especially with our managed services. Now, how do we measure voice quality? Bill Stevens calls me from our service and says, Chuck, I don't see anything wrong. I'm getting a MOS of 4.2 on this loop. I don't know what the customer's talking about. What did he just say to me? He just told me, Chuck, that SIP call that the customer just made, we were watching it, we did a MOS score on it, a mean opinion score, where five means the best, one means the worst, and at 4.2, that's as good as PCM or good old toll quality. So there is a measuring device in SIP for voice quality, and most people use is MOS. Now, MOS itself, mean opinion score, is a subjective measurement. Uh, here we go, Chuck, get nerdy again. What do I mean? MOS, what they do to create MOS and the levels of MOS is they put a bunch of people in a room, very quiet, and they play calls 
using the different codecs, G711, G729, G722, G724, G728. You didn't realize there were all these, right? And the people rate them one through five. So it's subjective. Eh, it's not very engineering-like, <laughs> but it's a start. This MOS has been around since like 95, 97. I've been using it for years. But in the early aughts, we came out with the R factor with MOS. What does the R factor mean? Right there, R equals R sub O minus L. Yeah, check, that's math. Just move on. What does that all mean? Packet delay, packet loss, packet infringement, packet impairment. We're now going to measure the SIP packets along with the voice codec to provide a better measurement of that voice. And at AirSpring here, all our devices, our Meta, our Sansei, our AdTrans, all do MOS R factor scoring. It's part of the service. But going forward, you're going to start seeing perceptual evaluation of speech caller, or what I call PSQ. I'm from the test and measurement world over the last 15 years before I joined Spire, um, no, AirSpring five years ago. And this is what all the nerds use in the lab. You go to an interrupt test, they'll measure it this way. And it is a full reference algorithm. And what I mean by full reference algorithm is that since it's in a lab, the endpoints are all in the same room. So the tester will send out a sample, impair it in the network, bring it back, and measure the same sample that was set out, full reference. You're seeing more and more of this being used at colos as it goes out and comes back. They can give you, and the measurement for this still is a one through five scale. Uh, hoping down next couple of years we'll see this at AirSpring and you'll see it at the Colos, but it's the new thing that's coming over the next few years. It's an ITU spec P862 for the real nerds out there. It's been around since about 2007. But main thing to know is that we do MOS R factor, part of the service, no extra charge. And now, I brought this one up at the last minute. Thank you, Ellen, for getting it in. Because over the last, oh, six months to nine months, I get all the RFPs, RFIs, RFQs, requests for quote, requests for product, requests for information at AirSpring here, and I review them. And I'm seeing more and more people asking for SIP refer. This is a SIP extension. Now, what I mean by extension isn't a phone extension, but extension of the protocol. So RFC 3515 is an extension of 3261 from the nerd point of view. And basically what it does is that when somebody calls me and I transfer them off net, someone from off net calls me and I transfer them off of my phone system, they don't tie up two SIP trunks at my house. That's what SIP Refer does. Here's actually, on the left-hand side here, it is actually the transfer, the transferee to the transferer transferring them out. And I have a slide here. It's a lot simpler. Party A called B, B transferred them or set, referred them over to C. And why this is becoming so popular, especially in SIP trunking, is as we'll see on the next slide, it's more efficient way of using the protocol. So as we'll see here, what we see here is uh, we start in the upper right corner here where Tom's calling Janet. Tom uses the PSTN, calls through the PSTN, who has SIP trunks. They're going through a gateway there, maybe through a session border controller to get down to that proxy at site A, PBXA, and then Mary goes, Tom, you dialed the wrong extension. Let me transfer you over to Mary, who's at a different site. When Mary answers, Janet hangs up, but without SIP refer, I'm using two SIP trunks at site A. Why? Because these are PSTN calls. They're off net. With SIP refer, as we see on the bottom here, and this is the AirSpring way of doing it, obviously you knew that, is that now when Janet transfers Mary and hangs up, the SIP trunks are both released. At site A, connections move from the PSTN by the proxy and the border controller down to site B. They did this in the TDM world. My Nortel is going to show here from the 90s. I believe it was called Release Trunk Group, RTL or BRTL. There's different names. But as you can see, some of the carriers and providers might want you to be A because that way you'll buy more trunks. That's not the efficient way. It's not the proper way to do it. Uh, here at AirSpring, our SIP trunks report, uh, support SIP refer. Uh, I bring that up in all the RFPs. I would urge you in your sales pitches with SIP trunk, you bring up that, hey, we, of course we do SIP refer, doesn't everybody? You just keep raising that bar. Everybody, oh, yeah, you know, we don't charge for it. Brad Port, Kevin Griffo, and Arno, 
uh, that, that team there to them, this is the normal way SIP's supposed to run, and we support it on all our trunks, whether it be local or long distance. So you can see there, just making sure everybody else is keeping up with the uh, air springers, as I say. But very important that it's called SIP refer. It's a standard. The key thing here is our SANSAs, our SBCs, our gateways support that. Site A, that proxy or gateway or APBX also has to support refer. So all parties have to report support refer to make that happen. Keep that in mind. Airspring, we do. Uh, I want to thank my friends at Cisco for letting me lose their slide here. That was your plug for doing it. Um, SIP in the PSTN, Public Switch Telephone Network. We all know what that is. That's the central office down the street that put me through college and paid for all my bills and bought all my homes, and it's all going away. But there's still some PSTN out there. So when a SIP IP network has to talk to the TDM, Time Division Multiplex Network, of the PSTN, we have to use gateways to do it. Remember, the PSTN is using the D channel and its signaling, and that's called Q931, and we're using SIP. Those are two different languages. So you'll see gateway products used in translation called NGCP 3435, uh, Media Gateway Control Protocol. Uh, the Meta supports that, even though we don't use it here at Edge Spring. All your soft switches, most of your CO switches, I know the old DMS 500. Can't believe I said an old DMS 500, but it is, supports that. And for those big CO people that, you know, between central office to central office, they want to send the signaling between, that SS7 signaling between, they would use a thing called SIGTRAN. And that's called signaling transport. It basically takes SS7 over IP systems. Um, don't know too many people using that. <laughs> uh, the media gateway, though, is still kind of popular. And as you see on the bottom there, you see the reference of the gateway, where on the left-hand side we have the PSTN PRI layer 3 comes into the gateway there, and then it comes out on the IP side as Q931 packets, excuse me, over TCP IP, and then, of course, the MGCP over UDP. So you're not seeing this. It was very, very popular in the early aughts up to about 2010. Now, now that, you know, after 2015, the FCC in the United States allows all the carriers to shut down their COs. So instead of, you know, being how, where am I, what's the silly code of the CO, it's more meet me at the colo and running IP. But just so you know that's out there in case you run into it, don't see it that much. Uh, oh, yeah. You had to bring about the elephant in the room, Chuck, didn't you? I love the picture, Ellen. Every time I get this big bit, Charles Lamon brings me in a nice big network, 8-node MPLS, 20 SIP trunks at the head end. We're doing this, we're doing that, and they got fax servers. Yeah, dead air. Uh, SIP with faxing. What is a fax? It's a facsimile. It's a half-duplex modem, modulator, demodulator, with a scanner and a printer. And they were first used in the early 80s, 1980, last century technology. But everybody's got a fax. The original design, T38, is the spec in the United States for taking fax relay support for faxing over IP networks in real time, in real time. It's originally designed for Group 3 fax terminals, 9600 BOD. That's 9900. It, it's a K. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I have to use the K word. Kilobits per second, right? Or 14.4, moving up. But the important thing, and Ellen Nate was laughing, he says, Chuck, I can't even find a picture of this. It's so old. This is what the relationship between T38 and T30. Well, let's define this. What's T30? When a fax calls another fax, you know, those fax tones, my fax isn't working, those multi-frequency tones, they use the T30 handshake. These are modem tones they use to tell how fast to go and how much data to transmit between each other. When I want to take that T30 data over an IP network, I need to use T38 to relay that signaling over the IP network. So as we can see here, we have a fax down the bottom on the left. We have a calling fax who makes the analog call over the PSTN. The PSTN has a gateway or session border controller or even an ATA, so it's her gateway, that converts that into IP packets, sends them over the IP network, sends it over to an off-ramp or off-gateway that converts them back to analog modem tones to go over the PSTN so all those tones get to the fax. What happens is that once the T38 sets up the calls, 
just remember in SIP, I use only G711. I can't use any other codec because G711 will allow me to pass all those modem tones through end to end. Okay, well, gee, Chuck, why do we have all these problems with SIP and fax then? I get at least two calls a week. I know. Pulse code modulation, clock synchronization, PCM, makes the world go round. All those COs around the world go back to one atomic clock outside of Kansas City. And they're all clocked at the same beat, same time. Why? Because they have devices that are converting from analog to digital, and they need to have the same clock reference to make that happen. I'm simplifying this tremendously, folks. Imagine that. So what happens on long faxes of 10 or 15 pages or more, probably 15 or 20 or more, remember what a fax is taught to do from day one. At the end of each page, send tones to see if we can go faster. Because they were originally designed to work over the PSTN, and the longer the fax call, the more it cost. So the quicker I fax, the less it costs in their mind. They don't realize they're going over IP. It doesn't matter anymore. So when you get about 20 pages in, the clocks, because there's no clocking on an IP network, there isn't a PSTN, they start clock slipping and get out of sequence with each other, and they send a failure. It is what it is. I know our team is working very hard here. Mike Chase, myself, Brad Port, we are trying to figure out for our SIP trunking products a better way to handle fax. Uh, we are trying some different technologies, and uh, listen to us. We'll hopefully in a couple months here we'll have a, a better solution. But today, as you know, and you've heard me say this a thousand times, if you're sending 10 to 15 faxes an hour of 10 to 15 pages each, you'll have no issues. It's those long ones. It's those fax servers that send out 50 faxes every 30 minutes of 30 pages each. This isn't going to work. We use the Adtran 908 as a fax gateway to the IP network. It supports T38, but as long as the PSTN is still involved on the op and this clock differential, we're going to have issues. So um, that's faxing. Hopefully I'll have a, next time we talk, I'll be talking to you about our, our solution, but we're still testing and working on that. Fax, uh, SIP with firewalls. Are you SIP aware? To make your firewall SIP aware, 50, 60, 61, and all those ports. <sighs> You tell that to a firewall guy, they're going to look at you strange. Network address translation and back-to-back -back UA. Oh, my God, Chuck, what are we doing here? We're routing the unroutable. In the IPv4 world and IPv6, there are certain IP addressing schemes. In the IPv4, it's 10.xx17331. And, of course, most of you know 192.168. You cannot route those protocols out to the public net. They're meant to stay private on a local network. So what happens at your home when you mow to make a VoIP call? Because I guarantee you at home you're all 192, 168 something. You have to be natted out to the public network. Natting meaning network address translation. We do this. Back to back UA, we're going to see on a slide here, I'm going to move forward because we're running out of time. We're going to see how AirSpring does this for you with our managed services. So if anybody ever asks you, hey, do you guys route 192, 168? You'll see AirSpring has three different ways to handle that. And yes, we do. Many security options. The, ha the hot and latest stuff is the TLS SRTP. That means we're going to set up a certificate between our certificate between our session border controllers and the customer's IP. That way it's secure end-to-end -end just like we are between two uh, servers on the network. SDN-WAN and MPLS, those are private network options that do encryption or are totally private. They can also route those unroutable addresses and do the natting for you, as well as keep it secure. Next. And here's our top 10 list for SIP trunking, whether it be air care online management, DTO, geo-redundant. We've been doing SIP for, I don't know, I don't know what, what, 10 years at least, if not 12. Encryption, best price. Probably do more calls than anybody else per month. You will have this handout from Ellen and her team. Make sure all your SIP trunk users get this so they show the value of AirSpring's top 10 list and what they're getting from us and the value we create. Next. All right. This, I'm going to show you four applications real quick here because I'm running out of time. But most of you are already doing this. I call it SIP head ending. Well, what do you mean? Well, I've got two remotes that have IP phones. They're going to use the blue lines to come back to the main location 
and the IP phones will register to their IP PBX. They use AirSpring's MPLS to QoS that above the data traffic to get back to that IP PBX on the far left here at the main head end site. But SIP with AirSpring doesn't stop there. We also provide SIP trunks, the red line there, on the trunk side of that PBX so that all those remote phones can share and contend for those trunking out. Cost savings, you don't have to put SIP trunks at every location. Also giving their IP phones the QoS so the voice sounds great as they make their calls in and out. I guarantee you every agent on here has sold one of this, whether it be with MPLS, next slide please, or with SDN WAN. The nice thing about SDN WAN is we can set the QoS for every application with our SDN WAN box so that we can set that maybe an MPLS you couldn't set your data traffic. With SDN WAN we can while providing failover. So it's the same application and diagram here that they're using 4G to fail over as well as SDN WAN to load balance, but the remote IP phones come in, go to the head end to get to the IPBX where their SIP trunks from AirSpring sit at and take them out to the PSTN. So not only do we provide interconnectivity from the remote to the main head end, at the main head end we provide that SIP trunking. Now I've seen a lot of deals out there where we've got the whole network because we came in through the SIP trunking, hey we're providing all the red traffic, red dot traffic here. Customer liked us so much that when the backbone came up we also got that network as well. So there we're using SIP trunking to leverage in to sell other products. And this one's for my dollar people. I'm, I, there's many of them that do this. They're all switching over from their dollars from TDM. Hey, they had a T3 or 28 T1s with us. We're now switching over to 200 meg gig E with 100 meg or gig E connection between their SBC or dollar and us. And we want to run both at the same time as well as have a backup over third party internet. This is our standard setup that we do with our dollar folks. It's very popular. There's no five nines anymore. If you have the network, we'll make sure you have enough loops so you always stay up. And whether they be SDN WAN, MPLS, or internet doesn't matter. We're your SIP partner to make these type of transitions. And this is the big one, folks. Every time you sell a managed connectivity with the internet or without internet and local SIP trunking, this is what we do for you at no charge. The nerds call it back-to-back -back user agents or back-to-back -back UA. As we can see here in this 908 in the middle, it's acting like a server to the customer's SBC or IPBBX, but it acts like a client to the AirSpring services. So that 908 is doing both server and client emulation at the same time, and we call this B2B UA. Part of managed connectivity, no charge from AirSpring. We've been doing it. We're taking those 192.168 addresses, natting them out as 45.4.4.45, talking to the AirSpring. We do that up to 200 SIP trunks on one, nine, uh, on one ad trans family member. What I want you to get out of this, we do B2B UA. It's part of the product. If you need it, we're there for you. No charge. And just show you real quick, we've done this, AirPBX using SIP, the phones come back over the loop, MPLS managed connectivity, talk to the meta, register, the internet traffic goes out the internet and off you go. Very simple. So you can see SIP is used in a lot of products here at AirSpring, the trunking product, the phone product, and we do it very well. Real quick, you all know it's our favorite 908. I use this as my SIP trunk handoff. When I TDM handoff, I can provide analog. PRI and native SIP, all going out SIP packs, all at the same time if you need it. It's all part of the service called Manage Voice with AirSpring. And don't forget, you got AirCare Portal for all the trunking PBX customers as well as SIP customers get their bills, reroute their DIDs and toll frees and download the report. The Eye in the Sky RMS is watching all those loops, all free, all part of that Manage package from AirSpring. And once again, good old, got to get the one throat to choke in there. Uh, bundle pricing, our voice quality. We've done this literally in the time I've been talking, the 45 minutes I've been talking to you, AirSpring's already completed 2.5 million SIP calls during this call. All right, sorry we ran over there Ellen, a little bit. There was a lot there. I'm, I'm sure I loaded too much in your minds out there. If you do have any questions, please star sick to ask. 
If this is something that a day or two from now you have a question, please email me or give me a call and we'll get them answered. Now, this is a lot of info here, folks. Look at it. If you can bring up SIP refer in your trunking pitches, B2B UA when you sell managed connectivity, just know all these services you've been doing, you've been using them. I just wanted to show you there's a lot of value to them because a lot of other people don't do it, nor do they give them free. One, One question. question. Can sure. you go over quickly how AirSpring then um, delivers uh, our LD PRI for the SIP users? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, you have an L, basically it's SIP trunking to the ADTRAN, and then we're just using the ADTRAN. In this case here, the ADTRAN would be a gateway. Because why? Stop and think about what it's doing. It's talking PRI to the customer's PBX. Good old 23B and a D. And on that D channel, setting up calls and tearing them down is all those Q931 packets. The ADTRAN takes those, but when it talks to AirSpring and the Sanse in our clouds in New York and LA, it talks SIP. So now it's doing a SIP invite. When, when the Q931 says, hey, PRI, go off hook, it sends a SIP invite with the information of the to and from, you know, what number they dial, where they're dialing from. In that invite, the Sanse sets up the call. The media comes in, the ATRAN puts it on the B channel that the D channel told it to do. And that's all done for you in, you know, 100, maybe 50 milliseconds. Why do we require two circuits? Well, you have to realize because we're, we're the gateway in that fact, if you think about it. One circuit's the PRI talking to the customer, and then it's the SIP circuit out there. Now, remember, we're also going to mark when we convert those PRI packets to SIP, we're also going to mark them for QoS. This is why we'd rather sell you a managed service because we like to, we're going to guarantee that voice quality with an SLA from that PRI interface all the way back to us. And if a customer would use their own router, I couldn't offer that SLA because I don't know if they'd be marking the packets right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, of course, if you run the infamous twofer where you have two PRIs coming in and going out SIP, uh, then all we're doing there is using the codec to crunch down the bandwidth. Instead of using 64K, we're only using about 30K. So, but good question. Thanks, everybody.